Welcome to the Inside College Soccer Podcast, brought to you by Sports Recruiting USA, the college soccer recruiting experts. Now, here's your host, Chris Cousins. Hi, everyone. Chris Cousins from Sports Recruiting USA here. It's a slightly different episode than normal. Um, usually we have a guest on and we talk about the life and stuff like that, but this time it's a special, um, I use the word special loosely, but it's a coronavirus special to kind of bring everyone up to speed about what's going on uh, in the college soccer world um, with this whole COVID-19 coronavirus situation. So yeah, we've brought together some of our uh, experienced staff um as you'll hear on the podcast everyone's kind of working from home at the minute self-isolating or whatever you want to call it but uh you hear a few dogs and a few cuckoo clocks and stuff like that so that's why it's not uh it's not great great uh audio uh in some places but yeah we brought together we've got um james Dawes, who's my right hand man in the uk office he he kind of leads the podcast because unfortunately i couldn't make it we've got don williams who's the head of operations uh, in north america and you've got ernie yarborough Matt Manel and uh, Mike Avery, all all on staff, all former college coaches, um, and even even national champions, uh, in in that as well. So, some of the most experienced college coaches over the last twenty twenty thirty years, in this little uh, mix that we've got of a podcast. So yeah, it's just it's for coaches, it's for players, it's for whoever wants to listen to it. Um, but we thought we'd 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 put together. A, some of these uh, college soccer experienced brains and just kind of run through it all. And uh, there's some good points made, to be fair, about for players, uh, about programs, about schools, for coaches, everything really. So if you're any of them, if you're a parent, if you're a player, like I say, if you're a coach, whatever, it's definitely worth a listen. So that's less of me talking, but get right into it. And this is the Inside College Soccer Podcast, the coronavirus special. So hi guys, James Dawes here from Sports Recruiting USA and welcome to another episode of Inside the College Soccer Podcast. I'll be filling in as host today in Chris's absence, but joining me we have Don Williams, Ernie Yarbrough, Mathis Manel and Mike Avery. Guys, how are we all doing? Great. Doing well, Great. thanks. Thanks for having me. Great stuff. Um, I think the aim of today, guys, is really just to shed some light, uh, you know, give some guidance, advice and opinion on uh, on the future of college soccer really moving forward, obviously with the highly publicised outbreak of the coronavirus, which has caused, you know, cancellation of spring seasons and youth tournaments across America and the rest of the world. So, so Don, I'll kind of come to you first. Do you want to start by recalling, you know, the timeline since this all broke out and how it's affected recruiting moving forward? Well, I can tell you that for myself, we heard it, you know, we heard about this whole thing about six to six, eight weeks ago going on overseas and uh, even in the beginning of February, we were kind of wondering how serious this all was going to be. And boy, has it hit hard. Uh, as you guys know, uh, last Friday, ironically, Friday the 13th, the NCAA came up with a, with a recruiting update. Um, they officially announced a dead period for all in-person recruiting. And, and at this point, it's at least through April 15th. Um, and this is, you know, in light of concern of the, of the, of the virus. So wh from what we know at this point um, is uh, most colleges have been shut down. Um, spring sports have been canceled. Um, uh, recruiting visits have been severely hampered. Uh, right now all coaches can do is phone calls, emails, video calls, text messages. Um, and they're not allowed to have any official on-campus visits, uh, no off-campus recruiting, no in-person contact, uh, e no evaluations, participation in camps and clinics. It's shut down. So, yeah. What do you guys, what do you guys think? I mean, it's, it's crazy, huh? Yeah. So obviously, obviously you guys, it's interesting because I'm coming at this from a massive, you know, I, I'm a former player. Uh, very recently, or only about two years ago, that I was back playing. So it's very interesting to get you, you guys, you know, coaches, former coaches, perspective on on this. So, Ernie, how does how does the coaches' um, approach change now moving forward in terms of recruitment, in terms of planning for you know next fall and and moving forward? I think one of the first things that a lot of coaches are doing right now is is evaluating where they are with their rosters, 
and dealing with their uh, internal operations within their athletic departments because one of the things that's been affected by all of this is the additional year of eligibility for some athletes in certain sports that won't be participating this spring. Um, and a, a former colleague of mine at one of the universities I worked with actually laid out a timeline for her sport um, that really shows this affecting athletic budgets for the next, you know, four to five years, basically, until you kind of wash this class out that's going to get an extra year. So I think the first step for a lot of coaches has been to kind of take stock of where they are and what they are able to do. Um, once that has happened, and, and this has occurred in the last few days, a few of them have already reached out to, to me with regards to what we do. Um, but now they have to look in a different direction to A, um, locate and evaluate prospects, and B, kind of take stock in how they get information about those players, whether it be video, whether it be recommendations, whether it be in person, uh, or not, sorry, in person, but uh, contacts that they use person to person as opposed to maybe having someone come onto campus. And so I think there's going to be a, a big area of need um, for coaches to reach out to trusted sources, whether that be a club coach, a recruiting service, um, you know, former colleagues that may be out working now, um, looking at kids um, to kind of open up the class for, for 2021 and then to find any immediate needs for the remaining 2020 class. Uh, it's going to be reliance on kids having good video, um, maybe playing in certain environments where there's coaches with more reputable reputations who have placed players. I think a coach's reputation for having done a good job in getting kids into the right environments with the right coaches who have had some success uh, is going to pay dividends. You know, we, we talk a lot about in the, in the college coaching circles about having trusted confidants, trusted sources, trusted people we work with. Um, I think that's going to be true now more than ever moving forward. What do you, th Mike, what do you, what do you think? Cause your wife does, uh, your wife's also a college volleyball coach, right? That's right. Yeah. So what, what's the discussion in the Avery household and what's your perspective, you know, having coached it at Notre Dame and, you know, having coached at Valparaiso and, you know, been involved in a while, what, what's her, what's she saying? What's, what's being said in the household? Yeah, I, I think very much what, what Ernie just talked about, but there's just so many unknowns, um, you know, and, and I think coaches are, are wired in such a way where you, you're always wanting to be working. You're always wanting to be recruiting. So everybody's got to take a pause a little bit and catch their breath. But I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out how am I going to channel my energy? How can I be prepared so that when things ease back up, I can still hit the ground running? Um, and so there's a lot of video. There's a lot of conversations on the phone and text messages and Skype calls and just a lot of activity of trying to stay connected to the player pool for her in volleyball and then, you know, for us in soccer as well. Yeah, I want to hear maybe – we'll circle back to it. I do want to hear, Mike, um, how you think this is going to affect the pro game since you're now involved in the, in the men's pro game. Yeah, for sure. What do you, what do you think? What do, what do you see, see happening, uh, Matt, uh, with, with uh, the timeline? How do you see this affecting the timeline? Do you see it slowing things down for college coaches or what? Yeah. I think that's I think that's one that it's probably going to be unique to um, probably to the school, but I think that there are there's some schools that have been done with their class for a stretch, right? And and that they're going to be fine. Now the schools that tend to take a lot of transfer students or you know graduated players uh, at the semester break that are going on to a pro um, environment, those are the schools that are it, it, and that always has a trickle down effect what happens at one school then maybe affects what happens at another place. I think that the hard part about it is if whether by design or whether by chance um, colleges have roster spots to flesh out and have recruiting needs to meet, um, especially as, you know, and, and obviously application deadlines are going to come into play, but this is going to be something that certainly takes what is kind of a stressful endeavor anyway, but it's really going to kind of compact everyone's timeline. 
And I think that the hard part is going to be for not only the prospective student athlete, but for the coach is that, you know, we always talk about the right fit and getting uh, a player into the place where he or she feels the most comfortable and is going to have the best experience and is going to be the right fit of school. With the timelines being, you know, just compacted, the decision-making tree is, is going to be really important to make sure that we ha you have good counsel on both sides of the equation because this is a situation that screams, hey, make a decision really fast. And, and as we know, when that happens, that's usually never a good thing. Uh, you know, just going over one of the issues Mathis had talked about was the roster opportunities for some schools having available space later um, in their class. You know, a lot of, a lot of the bigger programs, uh, especially on the women's side, are going to be wrapped up early. Um, but several programs leave a spot open for a transfer, um, a late ad, maybe an international type that comes to them through their contacts and sources. And one of the things that goes with those spots is having available aid. Um, and I always said that, that any coach probably has at least half a scholarship available. And if they don't use it on a transfer or a late addition, they're able to rework it into their team um, roster at that time. And so one of the things I think that having co good contacts on both sides, as Matt has talked about, um, was basically uh, knowing how that money is going to be affected by the budgets that are going to be affected by having additional years for spring athletes. You know, you're talking about potentially millions of dollars in aid that have to come from somewhere. And so if a coach has, at this point right now, has, you know, $50,000 available in their budget, does that mean that they're going to get to use it? Or is the school going to come and take it to reallocate amongst other sports out of need? And so having the ability and trust in coaches that we have or that you know to get that information and be able to use it. Um, is going to be very important because there's no guarantee that just because the money's there that a coach is going to be able to use it moving forward. And Ernie, you mentioned you mentioned there about uh, you know having money available for transfer kids coming into the programs, right? So how how does that look in terms of you know transfer or guys that are at junior colleges or looking to transfer this year? They've had their spring seasons cancelled, so a lot of them haven't had the you know the opportunity to play in front of the you know, the D1 schools in, in the spring season games or, you know, other schools. And, and that's a massive part of the recruitment process, surely, in terms of, you know, the transfer process. So, guys, how do you see that working for guys that are at junior colleges now trying to make that next step? What, what can they be doing to, you know, maybe secure a move to, to some of these schools in, in the, you know, the event that their spring seasons have just been cancelled? I mean, I'll go back to it. I think a, a big step for them is going to be, again, as – I mentioned in the first part, having good connections, whether it's their junior college coach, having the connections needed, whether it's a former club coach that they've played with, uh, maybe it's a player that they've played with at their school who's at another school now that they can get in touch with coaches. I mean, I know when I was at Marion, um, that happened with a couple of players from junior colleges where, you know, hey, coach, I got this kid who's wanting to come and, you know, I look into things and, and move forward accordingly. And so, again, I think it's going to be a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, whether it's services, whether it's coaches, whether it's former colleagues and contacts, these kids really have to use whatever availability they have within their network um, to get their name, their video, their information out to as many opportunity um, schools as possible. Mm -hmm. And Don, I, I was reading the other day, I came across it on social media that, you know, coaches leave it until the spring season to to make the decision up on players whether, you know, they're going to reward them more scholarship next year or whether they're going to look to bring someone in in that position. So players are really fighting for places during this period. Um, do, do you see that in the event that all this is happening? How, how do you see that affecting, you know, guys that are in programmes already that maybe were fighting for extra scholarship money? Is there any way that, you know, that how a coach is going to approach that issue now? Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's it, while it's true. I mean, we a lot of times we use that spring as an evaluative process to 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 let players play. Maybe they didn't get a whole a lot of chance to play in the fall and and to see how they interact um, 
um, with that challenge and that, or that monkey on their back, you know, and, and, but now I'm not sure that it necessarily changes a whole lot because the, the last evaluative pieces of the new players coming in has been slowed down, hasn't it? So there's going possibly less competition coming in for those spots. I, I don't, I don't know. What do you think, Matt? I mean, this one, this is where it gets kind of tricky, right? And this is, and the hard part about this whole thing is that it, everything, all that stuff can happen at once. I think the part that is, for me, if I, looking, if I put on my coaching hat, I'm like, if I had left it late, um, now the hard part is, is one, am I going to have the money and all depending on the health of your athletic department and you know, how good your baseball team and softball team are and, and how much and how, you know, so that every school will be different how they do it. But then in terms of, you know, you've got transfers, you've got JC, you've got four year kids, then you've got the international piece where, you know, these are kids that are really waiting maybe to the end to whether or not they're going to get pro deals or whether or not, you know, college in the United States is the route to go. But then if I'm a college coach, and I'm looking at this, this is completely, this is hard because now then I may have to commit this money to a player that I'm not really sure about, or they're not really sure about us. And then you talk about transfer stuff and then we start getting into the APR. So for me, this, this literally, and, and we've talked about this, you know, offline is that to have that trusted resource and to be able to you know, like Ernie said, someone I can trust and someone whose opinion that I value. But then also, too, you know, when you talk about kids coming from an organization, knowing that the organization is not just signing whoever, but they're trying to get players that have the ability and, and trying to get them to that right fit. I mean, I, I literally I look at this and it's I, just from the soccer perspective, I look at the coaches that are having to manage this and I have no envy to them whatsoever. This is, this is really such a surreal and strange time and it would be hard. And, and as a parent of a kid who's of, of a player who's starting to enter into that college recruitment process, if I was a parent dealing with this now, man, I would be over the moon stressed out. Yeah. Mike, what we're kind of talking about how it affects the 2020s, but Let's talk about it, maybe how it how it might affect the 2021 class. Of course, it's a little speculation here we're going on because is this going to go on? Frankly, I think it's going to go well past the April 15th deadline that everybody seems to be putting on it. If you look at what's going on in China, it took you know nearly you know four months to burn itself out. It seems to be slowing down a little bit from what I hear. But so, geez, you know. Pe- tack another two, three months onto this, and we're missing some of the main 2021 recruiting season, considering that the national signing day was moved up to November, right? So what do you think, Mike? Yeah, I, I think, again, you know, it's all speculative right now, but, you know, I think coaches are going to worry about the most important thing first, which is the team that they have on campus or had on campus most recently and what happens in the fall. Um, and I think that's going to take up a lot of their time. And then I think all, then you're going to start thinking about the next group in the 2021s. Um, and in some cases, the 2022s, if you're, if you're coaching on the women's side. Um, and so, you know, I, I think everybody, you know, my best advice to everybody, coaches and the recruits, is I would, I would be as organized as I can be. And so I'm as agile as I can be so that when any opportunity comes up, I can jump. Um, whether that's in me recruiting a player or a, a player looking for a school. I think you have to have all your ducks in a row as much as you can, as much information compiled as you can, uh, and be ready to roll when you, when you need to because um, those people that are able to move quickly are, are the ones that are going are gonna to start winning as soon as this thing opens back up again. And um, Matt, just on that point, do you, think, do you expect to see changes next year in terms of the teams are that are, that are competing at the top, of, you know, for national titles. Or do you think those teams will remain at the top? Is it anybody's game at the minute? What, what do you what do you see the future being? Yeah, you know, I, I guess it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think the teams that are at the top are at the top for a long time, and, and probably will be there again for a reason. You know, um, mm-hmm. and I think they're they're typically ones whose rosters don't have as much shifting going on 
Um, you know, they're not sending a couple of guys off at the end and taking a couple of last minute players in. Uh, they have more stability in their rosters. Um, but uh, again, you know, there's so many unknowns that we, we, we don't know about. What if you have an international player that had been, been home for spring break and can't get back? You know what I mean? It's, yeah. There's all of these factors that we, we just don't really know what it's going to look like. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're counting on incoming players. What if the clearinghouse gets slowed down? You know, all of these things they might have an answer to from the NCAA standpoint, but even in the best of times, it's sometimes slow. So what happens now? Um, it, it's going to be – it's the wild, wild west in many ways. Um, yeah. It's going to be interesting to watch. Absolutely. And, yeah, Mike, Mike sorry, to I, jump in – hold on. No, my bad. Um, so, Mike, jumping in on that point, but there's, there's a whole other level, and you talk about the top programs, and we see this more and more as top programs are committing kids, especially from, US, from MLS academies, right? And then all of a sudden those kids sign a homegrown. Well, the hard part is, is now that the professional game is on hold and they're waiting, especially in this country, those kids, you know, that you had kind of allotted for, but then kind of had not allotted for, um, because you think, oh, well, they're, they're with the LA Galaxy and we think they're going to sign a a pro deal. We've got a spot for them, but we're not really, that's a whole nother level of player that then may say, Hey, where the parent club's like, listen, we don't either have the training room or we don't have the funds or it's not great for your development cycle. Go to college and get some games in because we're not going to be able to fit you in because of the compacted nature of what the MLS schedule is. And that's a whole nother wrinkle. And when that starts to happen, we talk about the finances part that throws everything into whack. And, And Ernie touched on, you know, they're holding maybe half or a full scholarship in reserve for that. All of a sudden their ability to, um, to be nimble, like Mike talked about, gets completely thrown out the window. So, I mean, there's this literally has so many factors um, in the game from the student athlete coming in to the student athlete who thinks he's going to be a pro. Well, maybe now he's not going to be a pro. He has to go to college. And this is, it's going to be, it could be really, really challenging. And especially then when you talk about the clearinghouse clearing kids, it's going to be really tough. Mm. Yeah. I mean, sorry, go ahead. Well, one issue, and and I think uh, I believe it was Mike mentioned this with kids going back on spring break and, and potentially not being able to get back in the country, and that could be American kids or foreign kids at this point. But the reality too is, what impact is this going to have on a foreign recruitment cycle? Um, you know, depending on countries, depending on you know limitations, depending on timing, depending on the clearinghouse, all those types of things. So. I just think, again, as Mike said, having a coach or a program, if you will, that has as many of their ducks in a row as possible um, are the ones that are going to get the biggest advantage because they're going to be ready to go with as many available options as possible when this starts to open back up. Mm -hmm. And James, you're starting to see some issues already uh, being in the UK and and bringing bringing kids over from not just the UK, but from overseas. We've got some SAT issues, don't we? We do, yeah. And and again, we're going into uncharted, uncharted territory, so it, it, it's hard to say how they're going to go get around this. Really, I mean, the NCA, like we said, that at the best of times, you know, it it takes time for guys to get through the clearing house. So without you know SAT scores and and things like that, um, the only way we can see you know the, getting around it is is by offering you know waivers um, and sort of treating this year as a I, I, I would say it really kind of letting the guys go through who haven't you know gone through already uh, without the SAT let's say obviously junior college is going to be a route as well if that's not the case um, again, again it, it, you kind of take it on a on a weekly basis at the moment it's not a day by day basis because it's evolving every day um, and, and and I mean I'd be interested to get your guys point With, without the SAT guys in terms of funding for academic purposes you know, getting accepted into the school. Can you see it go going any other way other than you know, let, letting guys you know maybe a pass this year or or giving guys a waiver? What what do you guys think? Let's let's recap real quick just for those that might be listening that may not be aware of of, of how this works. Um, uh, the NCAA um, requires. Um, the SAT or the ACT in which a score is equivalent 
um, on a sliding scale. So in other words, the higher your GPA, the lower your score can be to be NCAA eligible. Now, now that doesn't mean you're getting into that school. Schools, certain schools have a, you know, a 1400 SAT minimum requirement with a 4.0 GPA just to get into the school. But it doesn't mean the school is going to allow you in, but it does mean that you would be NCAA eligible if you meet uh, grade and SAT requirements and or ACT. And the NAIA, on the other hand, it's it's different. Now, Ernie, you just coming, having come out of the NAIA, I believe, your last school, right? But why don't you kind of explain to everybody how that how that works with the NCAA, how they can get around not taking the SAT or the ACT? Well, one of the things that the NAIA did last year because they revamped their clearinghouse um, protocol was they allowed schools to quote unquote vouch for the student athlete. And so, and we actually did that for one young man whose transcript hadn't been cleared um, in time for the fall season. And so basically what it meant was the school kind of put their, you know, compliance officer, if you want to call it that, or person in, in charge of the relationship with the, with the NAI national office, um, basically took responsibility and the, and the penalty option if it came to pass that that person wasn't um, going to get qualified. And so arguably, you basically did your own homework. You knew what their GPA base was. You knew what their test score base was. You knew what their class rank base was. And you kind of said, hey, even though you guys haven't done it yet, we can tell you that this kid's going to pass. And so that was definitely a, a step away from something the NCAA had ever done. Um, and, and it worked very easily. I mean, simply put, we were the first program at our school to, to utilize it. Um, the AD basically signed off after meeting with you and the academic advisor person that was involved. Um, and so that was a big step different than the NCAA. Outside of that, um, you know, basically there was always going to be a bottom line score. Um, How does the fifty percent rule come 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 into play? So, oh, oh, the price. That's that, that, that's that kind of what I was thinking of. Yeah. Sorry, that has to do with scholarship aid. So yes, if you can't take an SAT now, how does that affect it? It could be an interesting way to look at it because the way it works in the NAIA, and this is completely different than the NCAA, is you have your allotment of aid. So in our case, it was uh, I think it's you know ten scholarships you're allowed. We were a 65% sport, so we lost you know, 35% in our conference. Our conference only covered 65% maximum of what you were allowed. And so you know, we were basically a 7.8 limit. Um, and then you, you multiply that by the cost of attendance, you know, full cost of attendance for your school, and you come up with a number. And so you're allowed that much money to spend on aid. And the way it works in the NAIA is any institutional aid, whether it's academic, housing, um, or athletic, is considered aid. And so in order to offset some of that cost, if a student athlete coming in has a 3.5 GPA or higher, a certain level of SAT or ACT score or higher, and I believe top 10% or top 20% of their class or higher, and meets any one of those thresholds, they are um, only half of that money would count against your total number. If they were a 3.75, a higher SAT, higher ACT, and I think top 10% of their class, any one of those three things, then none of their money counted against you. Um, and so you really, you know, finding the, the high end academic who was also a good player was definitely on on top of your list because it, it, it affected your roster quite a bit and your scholarship aid. The caveat to that is once they're on campus and with any junior transfer, or sorry, um, four-year school transfers or junior college transfers coming in and getting that school's GPA, um, if they have a 3.3, they're 50%, or 3.6, they're zero. And so there's definitely, again, for those junior college kids or those transfer kids to keep their grades at a high level and to keep kids on your roster academically strong, there is definitely a financial incentive for your scholarship budget to make academics a priority. So if I hear you right, it sounds, it does sound like if 
an overseas player can't get to an SAT testing center in time because the March dates, by the way, have been wiped out right now. We don't know when the next international date is going to be for testing that they're going to be able to hold. The NAIA could be a possibility for that player. Is that correct, Ernie? I would have to check on that to make sure that they still that they're going to have a minimum test score standard. Um, again, each school was put in a position last year to vouch for a student, but they still had to have a test score. And so how that affects that now, um, I just don't have the answer to that. I can find out very quickly. Um, but again, when it comes to the actual scholarship piece, I would venture to say that the GPA or a class rank can trump a test score um, situation. You know, the test score is only one of the three prongs that had to be met. And so right. if you met any one of the three, you could, you could go over those limits and, and, and get the scholarship reduction. So, you know, at the end of the day, how this affects what's going to happen at the NSA level, how it's going to affect at the NAI level, because the kids can't take the test, that's a different question that I just simply don't have the answer for at this moment, but I can certainly find out rather quickly. Yeah, and of course, junior college is going to be an option as kids are not qualifiers to go into the NCAA. They've always been able to take the junior college route, get the AA degree. That would make them a qualifier um, without ever having taken what, the SAT. With, with that being the case, do we expect to see a real rise in the level of JUCO, you know, standard this year? Or do, do you think more players will look to go down that route? What, 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 what are we expecting? What do you What do you think, Matt? What do you You've uh, You've been around a while. You've You've uh, looked at a few JC kids in the past. What do you think? Well, I, th I think the JC kids are. It, it's going to be awesome. I mean, and again, you know, it's all speculation. This is assuming that the NCAA rules in a favor of sanity and with a student athlete's best interest at heart. There's also the other chance that the NCAA says, "Okay, you know what? You don't have the SAT score. Okay, you're out," and then you absolutely the JUCO or the NAI route comes. And I think that probably, you know, like Mike talked about is it being nimble, you know, players are going to be nimble because really as, you know, and again, speculation is tough, but, you know, I, I think that the JUCO route, especially given how this is going to go, I think you could see a lot of players do that. And then the wonderful thing about that is if they're a qualifier or if they, then they go to JUCO. They don't have to get the AA degree. They can just go for a year and then be eligible to go to an NCAA school. So if you know you're a decent, you know you're a good student athlete and you know you've got a good profile, you know, the JUCO route may be really good because, yeah, you're going to burn a year of eligibility, but you're going to be able to put good stuff on tape and, and then go after a year. So, yeah, I think the JUCO ranks, you know, in terms of James asked about could the level go up, I think that you could end up with a really high influx of players to that just because, you know, JUCOs aren't facing the same kind of entry rule. So it could be really good. Yeah, and I just want to clarify that real quick. Um, unless it's changed, I, I still believe that you have to be, in, in order to not stay there two years and get your AA degree, in order to be out, able to go out after just one year, you need to be registered with the NCAA Clearing Center and be a full qualifier going into junior college. Is that everybody's understanding? That's correct. Of, right. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just going back to that, obviously, as, as a former JUCO player and, and a and a college player, just in general, um, I mean, me and Don were speaking about this earlier. Uh, obviously, the NCAA was due to vote on, you know, the ten month season. I think that was coming up in April. Um, now, you know. Over social media, seeing friends have the seasons cut short. College is short enough without, you know, without any of this going on. Four years goes by really, really quickly. So seeing, um, you know, friends have the seasons cut short is, is obviously devastating. But does this bring to light some of the really positive aspects of, of the spring season in terms of, you know, for players, you know, improvement and development, but also coaches in terms of recruitment? Does this change people's opinions, do you think? Ernie, do you want to comment on that to start? Or Mike? What do you think, Ernie? What do you think? Uh, go ahead and repeat that again. I had some kids running around in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was saying that, um, obviously, with everything going on, um, you know, seeing players have the, have the year cut short, the spring season's cancelled. Ah, um, uh, yes. Do, does this bring to light all the positive aspects that the spring has uh, in terms of, you know, from the players' point of view, but also, 
you know, coaches when we're talking about recruiting a lot. That's been our main focus today. Yeah, I mean, there, the spring discussion around college soccer has been going on forever. Um, you know, one of Mike's mentors, Bobby Clark, used to say it best. Um, you know, the spring is basically a lot of studying because matches are the test. And at one point they were trying to take away spring competition in, in general. And he and I had a great discussion. He said, how do you evaluate your students if you don't give them any tests? And so when they've lost that now, um, it's going to be difficult for coaches to evaluate what they have in their own pool right now. I know Mike mentioned earlier, um, you first have to take care of those kids on, on campus and, and in your roster currently. At the same time, you know, what level of development are they going to have? How are they going to compete and fare against what you think you have with an incoming freshman? I think potentially um, from a recruit standpoint, there's a great opportunity if you're out taking advantage of any training you can do on your own, any training you can get in a small group, um, individually with a coach, whatever it may be, um, to take advantage of potential opportunities within a college roster when you get there. Um, but again, I think the bigger question may be how important is this preseason going to be? Um, should we be allowed to have them over here um, with the timing of everything? Because you're going to have kids that maybe haven't played in six months, four or five, six months. I think Mike's opportunity, should the NPSL season or what is it, USL 2 now season come to pass, I think that's going to be a great opportunity for kids to get oppor uh, chances to play um, and coaches to evaluate some of their players because the spring season's being, being cut out now. And so, you know, that, that six to eight week period where you had, you know, at the NSA level, daily training and matches, um, the NAI level, again, daily training and matches, and the junior college opportunities to play some of those other levels. Um, and that's the other thing too in the spring schedule that a lot of people may or may not realize is that's the opportunity for a quote unquote lower division to play a higher division. You know, for an NAIA team to play a Division One team, for a Division Two team to play a Division One team, a JUCO team to play anything above them, um, and for those players to test themselves against the different levels and, and the different levels of talent within the game. So I think it's going to expose a lot of players. It's going to expose a lot of programs. But at the same time, I think it's going to provide a lot of opportunity for players coming into programs to maybe have a bigger impact than maybe they've ever had before. That's a nice segue right there. I'd like to hear what, what Mike, what you have to say, being currently in the program, pro game, uh, how you see maybe this being utilized for coaches to, to be able to evaluate their, their players in the summer, maybe in a way that they didn't before. And then, then after that, Mike, I'd like, uh, uh, Matt, sorry, I'd like to hear what you had to say, having your son in that situation at DC United, um, you know, needing to be evaluated along with everybody else, and this whole thing slows it down. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that the the NPSL, the USL two, that fourth tier of soccer in America could be huge this summer if we have a chance to play that season. Um, you know, right now, I know that in in my situation our ownership or following the directives of the league office and, you know, it gets pushed back two weeks and then pushed back another two weeks and pushed back. There's going to come a point in time where uh, if it gets pushed back too far, they might not be able to play. And then if that happens, will these teams be able to survive? Cause the ownership's not set up not to play. These are, you know, smaller markets and smaller budgets and hopefully they'll be able to survive it. But that's going to be a real interesting challenge for a lot of these programs uh, at the USL2 NPSL level. But if it does happen, if in May we're playing soccer, and God hopes that we do, um, I think we can be a, a huge step for these kids that are preparing for their college season. Um, because as, as Ernie just mentioned, some of them won't have played for a while. And so, you know, you, you get to go in for a two and a half week preseason and jump right into a college soccer season this fall, um, that could be a real challenge for somebody. Um, so, you know, you could provide them another six, eight weeks of, of preparation. So it could be a really, really big step if we get a chance to play it. Yeah. And, and somebody's cuckoo clock, by the way, according to my computer <laughs> is, uh, two minutes early. So you may want to check your, uh, <laughs> check your setting on that. Um, what do you, what, what do you, what's the word coming out of the, 
the pro camp? Uh, what did your son hear coming out of DC United, uh, Matt? Well, I mean, it was, it, it, it's fascinating. You know, one, I think that, you know, and again, is one of the things I really have to say just as a parent, just the, the MLS's response to it uh, with their pro players and then the way it trickled down to their academies was really pretty awesome. And, you know, they immediately, as it kind of started to figure out what this was, they suspended training and they had taken some steps for social distancing and had had kids bring in their own water bottle and had some rules and, and even changed some of the, the activities to where it was more of a technical based session. So that was as a parent, that was pretty sharp. But then as it became apparent, uh, what was going to happen, you know, so my son is obviously lives in DC and, and trains with, with their group. Um, and now he's back in, in North Carolina. And, you know, at first it was two weeks and then it kind of expanded. And then as it goes forward, right, who even knows if they're going to finish out that season. And that's, it, it, it's going to be really challenging because there's, there's a whole nother level to that too, is because especially in, the development academy, but in particular in the MLS academies where these kids are hoping to be pros, well, now you're pressing pause on that develop those individual development programs. And now you're also pressing pause on the evaluation of those programs. And it's just going to create such a backlog. And um, I think one of the things that yeah, I mentioned it before, there are kids that may have been fast tracked to where the everyone they included thought they were going to be pros. This may disrupt the way things work in the business side of things to where there's a whole nother player pool available at the college. And again, that just, and the hard part is, is for the players from places that are off the beaten path or are coming from places that aren't, don't have a lot of eyeballs on them in terms of soccer professionals. Um, that could get challenging because then there's a whole lot of wolf hanging fruit for, especially for these programs and these top programs that are going to be in the mix for. So I think that, you know, again, not to toot the own our own horn here, but I mean, it literally is going to be about advocacy. But I, you know, the pro side of it, I mean, you know, from the first team, all the DC United guys are out and they are self quarantined, and then that trickles down to the USL group at Loudon, and they're on quarantine, and then that trickles down to the academy players. And you know, it's been fascinating to watch the emails that uh, these guys are trying to get back to you know, to keep these players engaged. But when you look at between a 19 to 17 to 15 and a 14 and a USL team and a pro team, you're talking, you know, a couple hundred players that are now have no interaction with the staff or with each other other than over the internet. And it's, it, it's, it just, it's, it's really challenging. And, but it, you know, obviously soccer pales in comparison to what's going on in our country and our world with this virus. But, it's hard to be able to explain to my 16 year old that was just living the dream of being able to train alongside pro players. So like, Hey, listen, I don't know when you're going to get to go back and we don't know what it's going to look like when you get to. So that's, it, it, again, it's, a, it's just all like we, we talked about the game. This thing is so new to everyone. It's up in the air and it, it's going to come back to how nimble they are. And so, and like I told him, I'm like, well, take advantage and get outside as much as you can and get your work in. So that way when it goes back, you're ready to continue to put good stuff on tape so you can move your career forward. But that's hard, right? Yeah, it is hard. And it's funny, I'm watching the internet blow up on um, uh, walls, right? People talking about wall work. Hey, get out there. It's just you and a wall, so you're not getting anybody sick. So go ahead and get some work out. And we, we've been trying to chip in by giving away our free wall workout. And uh, we've been just trying to help people stay calm because this could be 30 days. It could be 60 days. It could be 90 days. We, we really don't know, do we? No. I think it just, this just goes back to why, why I'm so in favor of, you know, uh, the student athlete route over, you know, going straight into the professional game. Obviously, if you've got the opportunity, a lot of players are going to go down that route. But in terms of gaining your education, I mean, who's to say, you know, something like this won't happen again in five years or six years, you know, so on. Um, when it's your son going through college or something like that. So this, this can disrupt the guys like uh, Matt was saying, you know, that have been fast-tracked and, you know, believe that they were going to go professional, you know, for years now. Um, and, and we're aiming towards that way of... So some of these guys might might not make it as a cause of this, you know, with the, with the backlog that we're talking about. It might mean less opportunities, 
um, available. So having your education behind you is vitally important. I know a lot of the schools have closed down, but a lot of them are moving towards um, you know digital learning and online learning, which you know will eventually be the future of how things are done. Um, but just on the program, yeah, like you, you can't plan for this stuff. Uh, you've got to react to it. Um, and like you guys are saying, the, the, the difference will be shown when, when we do get back to playing soccer. The guys that have been putting in the work at home um, and, and by themselves, keeping themselves fit, healthy, you know, nutrition is another big part that we haven't mentioned. Um, and yeah, the, different, the difference will be there for all to see. Would you agree, Don? Or? Yeah, I think so. I think that sounds fair. Um... Yeah, that's, that's, that sounds, sounds about right. Um, does anybody else have a, a contrary take to it? No. Matt? No, I mean, I, I wouldn't, su I don't, success no, favors the prepared. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things that we talk about, obviously, you know, the vote was supposed to happen in April to go to that 10-month season. I think that a really negative part of this and, you know, and Ernie and Mike, you've been in the NCAA a long time. And I think, I think you're going to agree with me. The NCAA and in particular athletic administrators are going to look at this and you look through what the nightmare was of, um, especially for spring sports, you know, had, you know, completed 10, 12, 15 games in baseball, for example, those kids are all getting a year of eligibility back. Um, if soccer went to a 10 month model, you could really argue especially that well with half the season left now you're talking about um a whole nother group of you know this is one of those things where financially this ever happening again and this type of uh shelter in place social distancing canceling group events like this if soccer was on a 10-month season not only would it be potentially um challenging but for the schools that aren't the power fives this could be completely financially disruptive in that it would, you'd almost be having to turn to players and say, listen, I'm going to give you your eligibility, but I don't have the money for you because I just don't, we can't, we can't afford it. And that to me, I look at that and that's the part that maybe disappoints me the most is I look at this and I understand the fiscal responsibility. I do understand that, but you know, for me, it's like can college soccer just catch a break here, you know, and, and this is, I feel awful for the softball and um, the baseball student athletes in the track and field and, you know, and also for the swimmers who are going to try and compete for, for a national title. But it, and I look at the way it's going to affect, you know, soccer, it's like, this, this is going to be, this could be really, this could be a real problem. You know, now I think maybe the opportunity is like for the NPSL, NPSL might become a true development opportunity where all of a sudden it's all filled with, youth and eligible players where literally the NPSL and, and uh, USL League Two might very well just be a great example of, okay, let's see what these kids can do in preparation for college in the next level. And maybe that would be awesome. But yeah, it, it's going to, to start to think about all the ways that this simple, um, the, you know, this coronavirus has started to affect not only everything, but just the landscape of just our sport in general. It's, it, it's mind boggling. Well, two, two things came to mind while you were talking there, Matt. One is, what about a track athlete? What about a distance runner who runs cross-country in the fall, indoor track in the winter, and spring track distance in, in the outdoor season in the spring? Do they get a year of eligibility back? And if they do, are they able to then run cross-country in the fall, which they've already done, indoor track in the winter, which they've already done, or do they have to stay silent on those two and they're being paid to go to school for six months when they're doing nothing to represent the school? So your question of the 10 month season that brought to mind, okay, we have athletes like that right now. We have athletes who, who are full year athletes that have basically competed in two thirds of the academic year. And so I would be interested to see how that's gonna be treated um, amongst the NSA and NAIA four year programs. And then the second thing that came to mind when you were talking in particular about the NPSL and the USL2 situation, and this would be a question more to Mike, who, who's in that situation now with Fort Wayne, is there really any discussion or could there be a real live discussion now to talk about communities having one of those two programs, NPSL or USL2, and almost treat it like a professional club team 
where kids are able to go to college, but yet not play for the college and just play year round with this professional club team outside the college realm for the kids mm-hmm. who could afford it. I mean, it, you, you could open up another avenue where, yes, there's a 10 month development program. We have it. It's, you know, maybe the seasons change for those pro clubs or the, you know, semi amateurs, whatever you want to call them, where they're, they're getting, I think BYU tried it a few years ago mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Where, where their club team was an actual USL two team. Um, but almost professionalizing, you know, college soccer to the level where kids, the only thing negative to that is the only money they get are academic monies. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then the club, the, the pro team would almost have to find a way, although they could at this point probably, you know, necessary expenses, pay enough to make it worthwhile for a kid to live somewhere. Um, maybe he pays 10 grand to go to school because he's a smart kid. Uh, that's an interesting mm-hmm. concept to even think about at this point. Yeah. The, the track thing is fascinating. The track thing, the way those kids look is they play three different sports. So they literally they have they, – no, but that's the way the NCAA looks at it. So if you, you – you, so if, you'll, if you run – if you run, um, say you, your freshman year, you redshirt in cross country, but then you uh, – oh, um, okay. yeah, so you, they are, it, is, it is literally three different sports, and running cross country doesn't affect your track uh, eligibility. So, and that's the hard part is because, you know, and then it's up to the school, like, Hey, listen, I, I can fund you so you can run track or it's like, Hey, you know what? You're graduated out of money. Take your year of track eligibility. Is there somebody that can use it? Yeah. And, there you go. and again, that's, yeah. you know, and that's, but the soccer part, man, it's like, I look at this, we were on a 10 month schedule. You could argue just based on the model, you haven't started the second half of the season. So say then mm-hmm. you give all those kids an extra year and I mean, just the, it's mind boggling because the transfer portal for NCAA soccer is already a thousand plus deep. It would go nuts because there would be places like, hey, listen, you're player number 18 on the roster. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I re- see ya. And that's like, now maybe the answer benefit would be there could be um, a ton of movement coming down, like Division One players going to find spots in D2 and AI D3. But man, that. <laughs> This whole thing is just, it's, it's just really, really challenging. And again, mm-hmm. it, it all comes back to the same thing. It's like, it comes back to the coaches and the student athletes that are prepared and organized. That's going to give them the best chance to be nimble and thus be successful. And that's, Absolutely. you know, and yeah. or, so in, yeah. in reality, if you don't know the answers, go find someone that help you can be prepared and organized. Yeah. Yep. I agree a hundred percent. I, I would be very, very hard pressed to believe that whenever we get it going again, hopefully it's sooner rather than later, that it's going to look the same way that it looks before this all happened. Something's going to change. And so, you know, I, I don't know what that is. I don't, you know, but something is going to change in this whole process. And again, I think these kids, uh, these coaches, everybody involved have to be ready for that because it, something is going to change. So guys, I- have you guys had any, you got a, you guys got a quick synopsis. You don't have to name this. I don't, in fact, we probably don't name the school and the coach, but you can, you can name the level. And I'll give you my first example of stories that we are being told. So we had one of our players that happens to be a, a overseas player being recruited by a division one school. The, uh, the coach said, I'm pretty sure I got more money for him. We can, we can, we can meet the family budget. We can make this work came back about four days later and said, well, now because um, we have spring athletes, uh, you know, beach volleyball and baseball and softball, et cetera, getting extra time, we got no money. <laughs> They're not going to give me any money. So there's one that I know for sure affected them. Have, since you guys have been talking to other college coaches and getting our players placed, um, have you heard any stories about already about how this is going to affect what are coaches saying is what I'm asking. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've, I've had contact with a couple coaches who have said that incoming players have made different decisions with their families about even coming to their schools now. So not only is it affecting potentially kids who are on rosters wanting more money or even recruits maybe asking for more money, um, I think it's affecting, you know, decisions of kids who have committed without signing potentially, who don't want to be as far away from their family, who may not want to pay as much money now to go to a school. 
um, I think you're going to see some transitioning and decisions potentially that could affect all of what we're talking about as well. Wow. Hadn't, th hadn't quite that. Well, actually, now that you say that I did have my, my first client that I've got that they kind of made that decision and I hadn't really connected at all nationally. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the guys that, that I talked to yesterday, he just shot me an email or a text, whatever it was and said, you know, Hey, I've got a couple of kids who have decommitted. Um, I'm not really going to know the full effect until probably mid April when all this starts to settle down a little bit more. He's like, so let me know what you have, what you're you know, what's available. Um, I had another guy write me last night who basically said a similar thing. Um, you know, he hasn't been able to get the type of kids, um, in touch with himself that he's had in the past because of some of this, he's not able, he's in a, a smaller school out in the Rocky mountain area. Um, so you, you can't get kids in to visit and, and all the things that we've talked about. And so I think, you know, uh, th there's, this is affecting a lot of things in a lot of different areas that, that maybe we haven't thought of before, whether it's the kid and the family's ability to make decisions or pay for things, whether it's a coach's decision, um, to use different avenues they maybe haven't done before because of the, the in-person and, and evaluative restrictions. Um, or the decisions universities are making um, at mm -hmm. an administrative level to fund. So, I mean, it really is affecting a lot of different things. And, and, and I continue to go back to the same as the others have gone back to those who have the information, those who are prepared, those who have the contacts to help in, uh, get them moving as quickly as possible. They're the ones, coaches, recruits, families, um, and even in some cases, universities that are going to move forward the quickest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a message that just came through to me about uh, about an hour ago. I just checked in with a, a coach. If I told you who he was, you'd go, wow. I mean, he's a very well connected on the women's side, very highly connected, said, thanks. It's crazy times here. Everything has come to a screeching halt. And <laughs> this is, you know, this is a very large program in the country do one program and is the way he feels is everything has come to a screeching halt and i've kind of noticed that even on social media and those of you that know me know that i'm pretty active in social media and i've noticed it's gone eerily quiet mm -hmm. eerily quiet well, well this, this you talk about so go ahead Ma. go ahead James. Well, I was going to say, like, the, the part we're talking about for player evaluation, but then the hardest part, and this is maybe some for the 20s, but especially for the 21s on both sides, both the men's and the women's game, is that kids can't go to campus. So we talk about the right fit playing-wise, um, but remember, this is where they're going to school, and obviously there's, it's going to be about football in some respect, but it's going to be about how do I feel? Do I feel safe? Do I feel comfortable? Do I feel like this is a great place for me to develop? not only on, on the pitch, but then off, offwards, it's going to be so hard to really make decisions, especially um, in soccer being, a, you know, a, you know, a, a, not an equivalency sport, not a counter sport where, you know, invariably there's going to be some type of financial contribution on the, on, on the student athlete's part. You're not going to be able to, for lack of a bad metaphor, you're not going to be able to go kick the tires. You're not going to be able to kind of see how this is going to fit. And that's going to be, we talk about the decision process that's really going to slow this down. And that's, you know, again, I, I, that to me, I'm looking at like, wow, kids, like coach, I really like your school, but I kind of got to go see how it feels when I eat in the cafeteria or what it's going to look like when I go to the student union or what does the chemistry lab look like? And how do I feel about the library as a, as a great place for me to study? Because until I go and smell the air and see the bits, it's, I, I can't make that decision that's tough because it could be like, yeah, it's a great scholarship offer. And yeah, I really like your program, but you know, coach, I'm also trying to go to school. So I need to go see where it's going to be. And also too, we've all have, you know, I'm a parent. I wouldn't have sent my kid to go play at an MLS Academy without going and sitting down and talking with the coaching staff and seeing the training facility and hear, hearing the philosophy, meeting with the trainers, talking about, what the insurance is for potential injuries, you know, what the rehab um, protocols are going to be to have them return to play. And like, I just, that's, and, and then you add the fact of, especially international players who may or may not have the means, um, but even if a school wanted to bring them over, they can't come here and see what it's all about. That's, mm -hmm. man, that's tough. 
I, I think uh, just just touching on that, I, I think we mentioned earlier from a coach's college coach's point of view, you guys are looking to guys you know that you trust to recommend players and such. The same works as an international player. Obviously, I haven't done it myself. I think having people you trust in and around you that can give you you know sound solid advice, whether it's you know us guys that uh, you know guiding um, guiding clients through this stage, or whether it's you, you know a guy that's in the program there reaching out to you know, players on the team rather than speaking to the coaches. I think from from our point of view, I think that's the best advice you can get or the best we can do um, in them circumstances. Similar to what, you know, coaches are doing in terms of the recruiting, where they're reaching out and, and just getting as much information as possible. I think that's all you can do at this time uh, is give yourself as much information as possible. But Matt, just touching on what we just said there, in t- from, from a coach's perspective again, is it is it very much hands to the deck for for coaches at this point, or is it a kind of, you know, we wait to see what happens, what unfolds with this? Uh, as you guys said, you know, there's a lot of unknowns that we don't know at the moment. So, is it a case of all hands to the deck, or is it a case of wait wait a few, you know, more days, a week or so to see what happens or unfolds? Well, I think the fascinating thing, you know, Mike talked about the team that's already there, and this is. This is, I'm going to kind of generalize, but this is the majority of what's happening right now around college campuses. Kids went on spring break. So then they were told, okay, you're going to have your spring break extended. We'll see you at this date. Now what's happening is like, come back to school, grab all your things and then go home. And then we'll tell you when you can come back for next year. And when you think about just the stress of what I just said, then put yourself in an 18 to 22 year old um, situation and then potentially do it where you're talking about traveling over long distances, the sheer expense for some families. And then imagine if you are coming someplace where you've been very fortunate enough to get a very high academic package or a high athletic package, or you're on a full scholarship because that's really the only way you are going to be able to attend that institution having the resources to be able to go back and forth maybe three times in the last week, I don't care how well off a a student athlete's family is, that is hard. And then when you add in the travel restrictions that you're starting to see with both airfare and so now you're talking about, can kids even get home the first part? And that's, so when you talk about hands all on deck, absolutely. You coaches are now becoming um, RAs. And, and, you know, helping kids move out of the dorms, uh, coaches, garages are literally like, listen, OK, bring your stuff to the garage. We'll put, you, you, basically, it'll be a storage unit until you, you get back here, because obviously you don't have the ability to rent a truck or, you know, you're you've got to jump in with this carpool and get home and there's only room for a suitcase. And and then trying to manage the academic piece. So literally, I think college coaches now are starting to find themselves full on academic advisors, full on tutors full-on travel coordinators, and then and then at the same time, just trying to triage the nightmare of information that is being asked of by parents and everyone else. I mean, it, so all hands on deck, absolutely. It's, you know, talking to, you know, in town here, the local Division One school, it talking to the basketball coach and the baseball coach, they're like, the baseball coach is like, I'm having to do all this stuff. And at the same time, putting my arms around guys and saying, I'm so sorry that your career ended like this, you know, because the kids that, you know, there's kids, he's got a, you know, there's baseball players who, you know, they'd love to use for another year of eligibility. But they're like, Hey, you know what, man, I've, I've already committed to take this job starting July one. And uh, I'm, so I'm going to, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to move on, you know, so you've worked 17, 18 years to, to play your senior year and ride off into the sunset. And man, so yeah, for coaches, all hands on deck, I, the skill sets that are being required are some that I think that these men and women didn't even know they had. And then now it's like, Oh, it, it, none of it, none of it's awesome. Mm. No. Well, that really puts it into perspective. It really does because I, I see through social media, high school parents complaining that it's not fair that the senior, you know, that they're, child coming in may not have the same opportunity because a senior had their season extended. But the fact is a lot of kids won't even have that opportunity. Will they? I think your, your point is very well taken, Matt, that they've been looking for jobs. They've got jobs to, to go on to, and they're going to be going on with their lives. And 
yeah, a lot of kids, it really is sad when we know how hard these kids work their whole lives to, to be able to, you know, walk off that senior year in, in uh, with their heads held high and being playing games, you know, not, not walking away. They've had to walk away. It's crazy. No, so guys, just to, I guess just to wind it down and kind of summarize, uh, I, what can players be doing now? Like we've said, it's tough on everybody um, this, but it sounds to me a lot like the most important thing is just surround yourself with people you trust, you know, get the information off those people, get as much information as possible and collate it um, and, and, and kind of just see how it all unfolds. Any have you got any sort of closing comments that you want to um, just add or? No, I think we've hit on a lot of important points. I think, you know, the biggest one that keeps being brought up is, is having as much available information as possible um, to be able to make as quality a decision as quickly as possible. For me, that means having people you trust on both sides of the conversation, whether it's a family, a coach, an advisor, a uh, service, whatever it is you've got on the recruiting side, um, as well as then people who are connected to the college side and their connections with coaches, people they trust, um, you know, because I think it's a decision for a lot of people that's going to come down to making it quickly um, and, and without maybe as much information as these decisions have been made with in the past, um, whether it's campus visits, um, whether it's time with the team, whether it's seeing the team play, all the things that we advise these kids to try to do as much as possible, you know, the kids that waited too long to do that are now going to have to make some decisions without that information. So having those people around you that are knowledgeable, that have the relationships to give you the information you need and put you in a position to make the best decision possible for you and your family um, as quickly as possible in this time is going to be the most important. Mm. Absolutely. Mike, do you want to add anything? No, I think, I mean, everybody's done such a good job at, at kind of wrapping the thing up. I, I think it's been nice for an hour not to look, look at the news. And so I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> yeah. to, to come on and, talk about something else and think about something else and um you know you know the silver lining i think in all of this is is it's a reminder to us all that we're fortunate we're talking about playing sports and going to college and you know these are great times in their lives and, it, and we're fortunate that we we get a chance to experience them um and really what's most important is that we're healthy and we, we're our family's healthy and safe and um, you, you know, so if, if we do hit the pause button for a little bit and we catch our breath and remind ourselves what's really important, this will value, will value these opportunities even more, I think. And so I think it's a good thing in that regard. Um, no, absolutely. Matt, Matt any, any final comments that you want to add or? Well, I, I mean, one, I'm going to echo what Mike said. It's been, it's been, it's been lovely to not think about any of this stuff and to kind of talk about the future, and even though we're talking about speculation, but at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're talking about something that's very positive. And I just, you know, it, it, and again, this is, you know, our, we haven't seen anything like this in, in terms of a global scale in a long time, um, fortunately, in terms of where people are facing hardships. And, you know, I think it, uh, Mike's exactly right. It kind of reminds you what's important. And I would imagine, um, you know, and, and my son left me with a really good comment uh, this morning uh, as he was going downstairs to do some school. He's like, you know, what? I, I, if nothing else, I'm so excited to be able to get back into the environment. And I was like, even the fitness. And he's like, I would pay thousands of dollars, dad, if I could go be doing a fitness test right now in DC. And I was like, and that to me, it was really, I was like, that's awesome because he's realizing what a gift. Um, he has to be able to do what he's doing and to play this game. And I was like, all right, fantastic. So there's a silver lining. It's like, it's just going to reinforce how wonderful the, this game really is. So, but I, I'm ready for this to be over. Like I'm ready. Let's get back to normal. That'd be great. Thank you guys again for, for coming oh. on and for doing this. And I think this is going to be valuable information that people are going to want to hear about uh, what, what we see going on out there. Absolutely. And what, what I will add to this just to, to finish is uh, anybody that's listening, you know, we're, we're trying our best to keep up to date with everything we're talking about, you know, the need to keep uh, keep up with everything and, and gather as much information as possible. If anybody does have any questions, uh, wants any advice, um, you know, these are the guys that you need to talk to. So 
uh, send us a message after this uh, and we'll do our best to get back to you, you know, uh, any, any separate questions. Um, yeah, we're here to help. You know, it's a troubling time, so we've all got to, you know, dig in and stick together. So, yeah, just thought I'd finish on that. Well, James, we'll, we'll stick this number in our contact information, but, you know, you can always uh, email us at info at sportsrecruitingusa.com. You can also get a hold of us uh, by texting us at 650-297-0655. Again, that information will also be in, uh, in the notes, in the show notes. So yeah, any questions anybody has, uh, as James said, we're staying on top of this whole situation as closely as possible. So yeah, guys, just want to say thank you ever so much for your time again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks a lot.